Your Grace, when you first took office, you had a vision of a, a pastoral plan for the Archdiocese, mm -hmm. a 10-year pastoral plan. Now, for those who are unfamiliar, can you share that with us once again? Basically, the, this 10 years plan is to align ourselves with the Universal Church. As you know that uh, presently, uh, what we need uh, in today's time in the face of uh, secularism and relativism, we need to renew first and foremost the people of God in their faith. And uh, this is the first aspect of the new evangelization that the Holy Father since uh, Pope John Paul II has been speaking about. And so as a uh, diocesan church, we are called to align ourselves with the trust of the Universal Church, which is primarily to renew our Catholics in their faith uh, with the hope that once renewed, they will be able to reach out to the world and to spread the gospel, uh, the gospel that uh, will impact every area of human life, whether it's politics, ecology, family, education, uh, entertainment. In other words, to bring the gospel values into the world. And uh, this requires first and foremost that our Catholics be renewed in their faith. So how do you mm. see this pastoral plan mm. unfolding and shaping the local church over the next few years? Well, we have already started this process, but it is going to be a long process. That's why I give a period of 10 years. Mm. Uh, it takes time for the people even to understand um, the real meaning of the new evangelization. Why is it so important? and why we need to find new ways, new approaches in uh, helping people to encounter the Lord and to feel that Christian faith is relevant in their lives and is helping to empower them in their lives. And so we need a long time because you know the message that is to be communicated to the people will take time at different levels of the church. We restarted with the leaders of the church, the priests, the religious, the church organizations, and we are trying to, at the same time, to align themselves together with this whole trust. So, and uh, there's still a lot of questions are being asked, sure. and uh, clarifications, and because the new evangelization is such a broad uh, you can say perspective, mission that you just cannot say in a word. And also, I can see it's unfolding because of the fact that uh, we have tried to put not only the clarity of our vision and mission, but we have also um, put the in infrastructures in place, which we are still doing, of course. So the first thing I did was, of course, to uh, renew our priests. That for me was important to try to reach out to them and uh, to make sure that we care for our priests and religious and therefore one of the important uh, ongoing aspects of this 10-year uh, plan is to make sure our priests, our religious are well looked after, uh, they are cared for and uh, they are empowered in their ministry. And that is why we are building a retirement home as well mm -hmm. for a proper retirement home uh, to give our priests uh, who are retired a certain dignity. And because of the work they have done, we want to show our gratitude to them. And also, the, besides that, we have the main offices that have been set up, uh, particularly the new offices like the Office of New Evangelization, which I think is very important as a catalyst to stimulate uh, and to reinforce mm. the importance of being missionary, evangelical minded in the churches. And uh, we have also a very important group of people that we want to focus on. Uh, I wouldn't say they are the future of the church, in fact, they are already the present leaders. Uh, these are the youth, and they are a very important group. And 
the office of young people, I think they are doing a great job in spite of all the limitations they faced, all the difficulties, uh, but they are doing a great job trying to bring more youth together and uh, not just reaching out to the youth in the campuses, but also to bring them together, to work together. That is also a great, uh, I see, a great uh, achievement so far. And then our Family Life Commission also have been working together uh, with all the other family-related groups, uh, organizations, and in the parishes, in the archdiocese, there are so many of them. So they have brought them together to work together, to collaborate together, and I see that is also a great another achievement. Another thing that we have done so far is to try to uh, be clearer of uh, how Catholic schools should work together. So I had a, a number of meetings with uh, the schools, with the supervisors, the sponsoring authorities of Catholic schools, and we have about to form the uh, Council for Principals in Catholic Schools as well. That is a new initiative. Right. Uh, we have already have a few dialogues with them, and I think we are making progress, and I think that will usher in well for the church. And besides that also, we have the, of course, uh, the most important also, or one of the most important key elements, the communication office, which we have a uh, really strengthened office, uh, because that is what is needed in new evangelization. The Holy Father asks us to find new other, new methods, and the new initiatives, and so we have started things for the diocese, uh, our revamp our website, and we have strengthened the communication office, we have gone into digital media, and I myself started the Instagram. Oh, uh, right. yeah. Mm. Okay, Your Grace, you obviously have mm. uh, so much on your mind, mm. uh, but it's been about three and a half years mm. since you've been in office. Mm. What has been your greatest joy being the leader of the flock in Singapore? I think the, my greatest joy, whether as a bishop or as a priest, has always been um, there is only one purpose really, to empower life, to heal the wounds of uh, society, to give people hope. Uh, even as a priest, I always feel that is what the good news is all about. That is where the poor is. The poor today are not just materially poor. The poor are those people, especially in affluent country like us. Mm. They are basically people who are lonely, who are depressed, who have no meaning, no purpose in life, they can be rich, but their heart is empty. Uh, it's just about money, about pleasure. There is no real purpose. And so for me, as a bishop, a uh, great advantage of a bishop is that I can reach out to a greater group of people. And uh, that is one of my greatest joy to know that I'm more in contact with uh, different kinds of people, different groups of people. That gives me a very uh, holistic uh, uh, understanding of the church and society. Not just within the church, but also outside the church, when I meet people from other religions, I meet the secular, political and corporate leaders. And so that helps me actually to also be in touch with what is happening in the world and their challenges. And uh, the greatest joy for me, therefore, is that I can reach out to them, which as a priest, I will have limited uh, capacity exposure. And so this for me, uh, in interacting with them, actually, um, I learned as much as the, I try to minister to them, but they have taught me much and uh, I feel very enriched uh, when you start interacting with people and uh, seeing things uh, from their perspective and their sharing, they too have uh, enriched my own life. Yeah. Right. But what would you say, Your Grace, with uh, so many things on your mind, mm. what are some of the challenges that uh, you see yourself facing in the years to come? Well, the first and foremost, this is a God's church. It's not my church. And uh, I have a mission, I have a responsibility. I try to do what I can. So I'm not too worried about what will happen in the future in the sense that uh, uh, at the end of the day, it is really the work of God. For myself as a bishop, I can only uh, do and respond to the promptings of the Spirit that the Lord has planted in my heart. I'll do all I can within my power and my influence to get people to be excited about the faith and uh, to be more conscious of their responsibility. 
and uh, I feel that you know one of the things that um, our people are not aware and this is perhaps the greatest challenge I think our people are not aware of the gravity of the situation why they need to renew their faith not just for themselves but uh, for the future of their children for the future of the church uh, for the future of society and for the future of the country that uh, faith is so important because it will impact uh, the future of Singapore really because if we don't have good families we don't have people uh, young people who have passion uh, enthusiasm and zeal uh, for service altruistic service uh, selfless service not just for the church but even for society in the country what will happen to Singapore and uh, I said the situation is grave uh, recently uh, we have the Archdiocese survey and it shows uh, uh, how serious the situation is because uh, the government uh, gives us a statistics of 373,000 Catholics then the survey shows that we have only 125,000 Catholics attending Sunday Mass regularly which means to say two-thirds of our Catholics actually are not going to church and uh, every year we have baptism maybe about 1,000, 1,005 at most and we are quite contented with that number at the same time here we are bringing a few Catholics into the church and many more are leaving each year probably after confirmation or even after RCIA because we don't have follow-up programs we are not discipling them mm. and uh, they are just uh, nominal Catholic uh, Catholics who are not really instructed in their faith they are baptized but they are not disciples that's the whole problem so how do you think we can excite them and, and, and retain them and, and, and to refresh them spiritually oh. and uh, I mean, maybe not materially, but really spiritually, bring them together and, and, and see God's plan in, in, in their so lives. So that's why the first thing of the new evangelization, that is the first step. Huh? Uh, all the popes, whether John Paul II, Benedict, Pope Francis, say the same thing. The first stage in evangelization is to help people to encounter Jesus. Mm. That's the first thing. That's what I'm trying to do for the conversion experience retreat. Of course, there are many other programs in the Archdiocese. At the end of the day, for me, is can you have a person to encounter Jesus in a very personal way? The more radical the encounter, the more radical the experience, the more radical they will give themselves to the church, to the mission. So if this encounter does not take place, then the Catholic faith remains simply an ideology, simply doctrines uh, there is no christian faith is about a relationship with jesus with god it is not about doctrines doctrines they are the explicit uh, formulations of our experience so this is the starting point how to bring so there are many ways of course you know retreats one of those ways of course helping our people to uh, pray more deeply uh, that's another way that is why the Catholic Spiritual Center is meant to help that help the people to pray but of course there are other programs which are equally important you know and to help our people to cultivate a deep love for the word of God but you see all these things cannot take place uh, unless you first if you need to fall in love first if you don't fall in love people they read the scriptures they find it meaningless when they pray within 10 minutes they find it to you know talking to the walls so they won't pray so people must first have encounters so that's why also i go to the parishes to conduct day of recollections and even parish conversion retreat hoping that i will help i can help them to encounter jesus your grace you've spoken a lot about the youth as mm. well mm. and uh, you have called them the pillars of the church mm. in a sense mm. and you spent two weeks mm. uh, at the world mm. youth day uh, in august Share with us a little bit more about your experience when you were with the youth. Yeah. You were walking with them, you were sleeping in the same area as, as they, yeah. uh, you walked in the rain with them. Yeah. Share with us that experience. Well, the, the two weeks of, or more than two weeks of uh, 
pilgrimage with them, I find that uh, yeah, it was a really a good time for me as a bishop to uh, get to know my ship, or as what Pope Francis says, to smell the ship, and that was practically what I did, and that was my real intention for going to the Holy of Day with them. And for me, it was really a great privilege to get to know them and to be with them, to listen to their struggles, to their aspirations. And I find that these people, uh, um, uh, they have deep faith, really. Uh, the fact that they would even sacrifice their time to go for this pilgrimage, and this is a real pilgrimage, and not a holiday. It's not a holiday, it's a pilgrimage. Because it was tough, you know, a lot of sacrifices, a lot of penance, a lot of difficulties and challenges. But they were all in good spirit. And I, what I see for them is the young people are searching for meaning in life, searching for purpose. And all of them, practically all of them, I can see that they ask the same question. What does God want me to do in life? Mm. And they want to do something meaningful, but they want to search for the call, where God is calling them. And I think most of them went for the world if they to discern what is the Lord asking of them because they want to live a purposeful life. And that's a great thing about young people. They're sincere. They're not just working for the sake of working or just working for money. They want purpose and meaning. And so when I work with, walk with them, I journey with them, I can see these people, they are sincere people, um, authentic people, yeah. at the same time struggling because confused um, with their own what we call personal struggles, relationships, because they are growing up, but at the same time uh, looking for authenticity. So I see, and I see that many of them, uh, if given the opportunities and given the right, uh, what we call um, direction and guidance, many of them would want to serve Jesus in the church, mm. provided their opportunities. Sure. Not necessarily as priests or religious, but uh, they do not mind really working uh, for the spread of the gospel. That experience, uh, how did that impact you spiritually? That journey with them? Well, the, spiritually, the, um, I learned uh, How to walk with them, how to be with them, and uh, their faith I find uh, truly inspiring for me. And uh, walking with them, I know uh, the struggles that they have gone through, the solidarity among themselves. I think that really helps us to be more bonded together. And I think uh, um, that experience also teach me the, what the real pilgrimage is all about. Mm. Mm. Because I, as I've said uh, to some of them, perhaps this is the first pilgrimage I ever did in my life. Of course, I've gone for other pilgrimages, sure. but I think the others uh, are very comfortable, uh, more of sightseeing. Of course, there are also prayers involved, but. This one was really a pilgrimage to live uh, in a very simple way. Things are not predictable and uh, to suffer the inconvenience. And that have taught me what it means to be a real missionary for Christ, what it means to really uh, give our commitment to the Lord. And so that's why when I see these young people, they are really inspiring. But I think most of all, if you were to ask me what I learned from this uh, whole trip is this, you know, um, if we suffer together, mm. that suffering brings joy, it brings life. So even though all of us were suffering in different ways, uh, carrying certain burdens and uh, str struggling with all the inconveniences, but we were still very happy and they were still very joyful because why? We didn't suffer alone. And I think for me, that is also an important lesson to learn uh, as uh, Catholics. We must not journey alone. If we journey alone, we cannot make it. If I were to go for the pilgrimage alone, I don't think I could make it. Because when you think of the hours of 
walking, standing under the sun, I don't think they will want to go. But because we did it together, we support each other, we encourage each other. So in that sense, uh, it was a real uh, lesson for all of us that if only Catholics were to come together in solidarity, working together in communion, then this journey would be possible. Okay. With that in-depth mm. look at, at how the youth were, mm. what is your vision for the youth in the church here as a whole? I think what is important today is that uh, we need to build uh, youth communities because uh, the stress today is on building communities, more so in a world where people are so individualistic. Uh, what people look for at the end of the day, all of us, huh, we look for love. Love also implies uh, communion. Love implies community. And so people are dying for authentic communities, not superficial communities. The trouble is that many of our churches' organizations huh, they have superficial communion. They come together not so much to build communities, they come together to serve, which is good, but it's purely functional. They don't work together, they don't come together uh, to see how they can strengthen their faith. Whether they are serving the choirs, as communion ministers, for me the question is, are they building communities? Are they strengthening their faith? Are they being enriched by their faith? Are they sharing their faith? Or is it simply a service? That is why our organizations, our members are not evangelistic minded because it's purely service. It becomes sometimes very myopic. It's just service for a particular work that they have been tasked to do. They don't even, they forget even to see this service in the context of a larger mission of the mm. church. For the young people, that's why I say, of course it's not only for young, uh, wherever I go, I say it's important to build communities and young people, if we build communities, the communities will support the members. And once they have shared interests, shared faith, shared vision, they will find the gospel very relevant. And within the communities, some will be Come mentors for the others. And I think this is how we grow. Anyway, the church has always, in the past, you know, grown through cell groups, small communities growing. So the church is a community of communities. And so we need to build communities. Um, but in a new way. I mean, NCC is one of those ways, you know. Right. But NCC has its limitations in Singapore context, uh, where people are working late or working overtime where people, where the country is very uh, dense in population, we are living so closely together. So, but we need to find different ways of building communities. NCC is one of those ways. If it can be done, well and good, praise the Lord. <laughs> but that might not be the best option for everybody. Right. So, like for the young people, uh, they prefer to be among themselves because uh, they need to share their own struggles in life and they support each other. So, my the uh, take is that uh, we should build uh, many communities and especially those after confirmation uh, mm. we must uh, start to build communities for them and um, because they will be natural communities right. since most of them will have come from the same class and they've been there together for 12 years even and so this is a natural community. So it's quite easy for them to gel and to continue that ongoing formation. So it's not the artificial group, a group that has already grown and is growing together. Mm. And this is where we will need to have, and I'm sure some of these people, that's why we need to give them formation, train them, and we hope there will be more full-time uh, youth workers in the church, full-time, uh, because the we are having a shortage of priests, the priests are old, or the priests have too many responsibilities, they cannot attend to all the groups, impossible. Sure. So we need to have lay mentors, lay uh, formation uh, workers, youth leaders, to continue to provide a continuity, so that they can continue to nurture these communities. And I think if we do that, uh, from among these communities, again, uh, 
there will be more priests, more religious. Because the Lord Jesus, uh, He never asks us to uh, have a vocation exhibition. The Lord says, you know, pray uh, to the Lord the harvest. I always believe the best way to promote vocation is simply this to give people a deep encounter with the Lord, to help our young people to fall in love with Jesus. Because if they fall in love with Jesus, eh, they will certainly, some of them will feel called to serve the church. So it's not a question of, I think maybe Christy life quite interesting eh, compared to a job of a lawyer. I think maybe I, this is not a career. It's not a career option. It's a vocation, it's a calling. But uh, calling requires that we first fall in love with Jesus. So I feel that uh, uh, the religious vocation will come naturally the moment when our youth are connected with Jesus. We don't even have to advertise because some of them will say, I love to serve Jesus full time. Yeah. And talking about communities, Your Grace, one of the most basic of communities is the family. Mm. And uh, <coughs> they are very close to you in your heart and that's why you also in your pastoral plan have formed the Archdiocesan Commission for Families. Yeah. Um, how are families today to face up to the challenges that they are up against? There's so much uh, that they have to face. Parents have to work long hours, as you know. Children are pulled left and right. So many different forces uh, in the world. But how can we keep the family as united as possible? and make it still the most basic Christian community? It's a great challenge. Da? In today's time, we need to be realistic. Mm. I think in those days, uh, we only worry about uh, material financial needs. But today, the building a family has lots of challenges because of uh, urban setting, modernization, and so the both couples, uh, husband and wife, they are working. And so the, there are higher demands on our children as well. Uh, competition is uh, very tight. And so, and plus, on top of that, with all the what we call modern values in the world, materialism, consumerism, and uh, we have things like relativism, so it's extremely difficult. And that is the reason why we don't have a solution as such. I mean, the solution, of course, is Christ ultimately. But I think the question is, uh, we need, again, to bring the family together. I think everything starts in the family. Um, the parents, they are first educators, actually, of the children's faith. So if our family uh, were to be really united, uh, values uh, to be inculcated, it depends on the parents. Mm. So that is the reason why, back to square one, how many of our parents have a deep faith in Christ? If their parents have no faith, hardly read the gospel, hardly pray, what kind of values are they to give to their children? If husband and wife are not deeply rooted in Christ together, they don't pray together, how are they going to be united with each other? How are they going to strengthen their marriage bond? So they are all interconnected. And uh, this is where I think uh, uh, there are many areas, you know, when we deal with the family. It's not just only family per se, because it's connected with faith. Uh, family is a special area, huh? one area. But then it's connected to faith. So faith formation also comes in, you know. Uh, how do we strengthen the faith? First, the faith. If there is no faith, you know, what Catholic family are we talking about? They just have been mm. Catholics who happens to, uh, families who happen to be Catholic, but they are not Catholic families. So first and foremost, they need to have the faith. So that is, again, comes under the whole, is for everybody, everybody needs to be re-evangelized and counted just. Once that is done, then this is where we provide specific support for the family. This is where all the, the Family Life Commission and all the other organisations, whether it's Marriage Encounter, Engage Encounter, Couples for Christ, and all these other programmes, they are meant to help. So, uh, so different people, uh, different couples, different age, different years of marriage 
will need different kind of support. And so at the end of the day, it's a question of support. Right. Support on the level, again, building communities. So many couples, they come together to share their faith, to share their marriage life and their family life together. That is one way. But on top of that, of course, they need to have programs. Right. Uh, so this is where the Family Life Commission as a body uh, can harness uh, all the facilities, resources together to have programs that are suitable, common to all groups. And so this is where, again, we need to empower the Family Life Commission. But I can say that it's a challenging task. But uh, on the other hand, let us be clear, uh, there is no need for us to condemn what is happening in the world. Uh, we should not be uh, uh, negative and condemn the world, you know, increasing number of divorces, same-sex union and all these things. We must understand the situation. Who is responsible? We are responsible. Because why? Because our Catholic families, our married couples, they are not showing good examples. They are fighting, they are quarrelling, they are divorced, they are dysfunctional children. If we come from a broken, fragmented family, do we want to get married later on? Do we believe in everlasting love? Do we believe in faithful love when they see their parents uh, unfaithful in their relationships? So we can't blame people who have given up on marriage institution, who have given up trust that the family can work, they cohabit or whatever it is. So don't curse the darkness. Huh? We just have to light the candle. So for me, uh, the only way to change the situation in the world is to promote family life and we have good examples of Catholic couples and Catholic families that can inspire others that it is possible, it's not impossible. If we uh, project the joy of a family life, then of course all the other problems will be resolved. Mm. So the, I think we should not be on the uh, offensive, uh, we should be proactive uh, in our approach to family life. Right. Your Grace, you also mentioned uh, you know, the values of the world, relativism mm. and secularism, particularly in our urban mm. lifestyle that we lead. Uh, and so many of our Catholics are in that particular mm. lifestyle. Mm. How can the Church help curb maybe the tide and the influence uh, of, of secularism and relativism? Within the church, within the church, um, relativism and secularism is always uh, the consequence of the absence of God in their life. When God is no longer felt and experienced. And so when God is out of our life, then to, uh, we no longer experience Him and without experiencing His love, the next question we, that uh, is raised is, does it exist? Mm. So again, back to the same foundation, you know. Uh, the only way to help people to overcome secularism and relativism is to lead them to encounter with God. Once God is encountered, then they will find unconditional meaning, unconditional love. Because at the end of the day, and this can be applied to the world at large, at the end of the day, what is it that is driving people? The will to meaning. Meaning is what drives people. But today, relativism, materialism, what is happening? Uh, the will to meaning is replaced by will to pleasure. Mm. Because people have no meaning. Without God, without the absolute, there is no meaning. Why? What are you living for? Why are you living for? For what purpose? Is it just eat, keep ourselves healthy, enjoy life, pleasure, and then we die? But this kind of life has no meaning, has no real purpose. This explains why in my contact huh, with those people who are now successful, who are now rich, they are established, and they all say the same thing. How much money do you need in life? 
How much pleasure can you enjoy? How many houses do you need to have? How many cars do you need to have? So, at the end of the day, we don't need much. Yes, we can have a comfortable life, but beyond a comfortable life, we need to live for something else. And that's why many of these people, at the end of the day, they become philanthropists, they become social contributors. Why? Because it is in reaching out to people, in serving people, that we find meaning. That our humanity is uh, brought out when we start relating with others. But I think more important than that is that, uh, you know, when the way to overcome secularism, the relativism, at the end of the day is, you need to have faith in God because the truth is, um, many people have given faith in everything. When you give faith, you have faith in God, you will end up in annihilation. Why do I say this? You know, uh, even those people who fight for justice, the truth is, there is no real justice in this world. Mm. Justice can never happen in this world. Huh? Why is that fellow richer than me? Why is he brighter than me? These questions cannot be answered. So if there is no justice in this world, what will happen to a person who is fighting for justice? He will be angry at everybody. And since no justice in this world, you must well give up. Since you cannot bring justice, then why are you going to fight for justice? That's why for us, there is justice. There is no full justice in this time through. But we know that after that, there is justice. And so it is this hope, and because of what Jesus has done, that we continue with building on justice and uh, spreading love. Let's look at education, Your Grace. Now, the Catholic schools uh, of the past and now seem to be very, very different. So how, how can we continue to maintain our Catholic identity and maybe re-own the Catholic schools once again and the ethos of the schools? You see, all these questions that you ask come back to the fundamental question. Are our Catholics alive in their faith? Are our parents serious about Catholic formation? Are our teachers who are supposedly Catholic, fervent in their faith. Today we have Catholic schools. Uh, even though teachers are Catholic, uh, many of them don't even practice the faith. And many of our parents, do they put edu uh, faith education as a priority or whether they go to the top school that is a priority, which is more important. Make sure he has the best academic formation or whether besides having a good academic formation that values and faith are important. So it is a, you can say, it's a multifaceted problem. It's not one. And then of course, we know that in our Catholic schools, all our religious, our brothers and sisters, they are dying breed, fewer and fewer. In those days, they were the icons of the Catholic schools. They would give that uh, sacred ambience. Now, in our Catholic schools, they are all run by lay people. So, for me, uh, we still can retain our Catholic ethos and values as before, or even better, provided, provided we strengthen our teachers who are Catholics provided our parents are willing to send their children to Catholic schools. If, of course, there are also limitations because of MOE and so on, uh, governing admission to the schools. Sure. But even that, even if the Catholic schools, uh, presently most of our schools uh, uh, range between 10 to 20% of the Catholic population. So in the school, uh, we have more, uh, about 80% who are non-Catholics. And teachers about three quarters are non-Catholics, no. but they're in a Catholic school. But the fact that in a Catholic school, they know the Catholic ethos and values, which many of them also support. 
the fact that uh, many parents uh, prefer their children to be taught in Catholic school means, yeah, although they don't have the faith, but they subscribe to the Catholic values that are being uh, taught. So I believe that uh, this is where, by giving formation to our Catholic teachers, um, conscientizing our Catholic parents, but that is not enough. You see, the problem is also we need to have uh, money. Uh, because presently, uh, it's a great challenge because uh, government, uh, for, for this kind, for government subsidy, uh, they won't subsidize for things that are related to the faith because those are public funds. So the, they will have to raise money to build their own chapel for Catholic activities. We have to use our own money. And so it's a bit challenging, I think, for the Catholic principal uh, to raise funds on top of that. He, the principal has to look after the other dimension of the schools. So again, this is where, how can the church support them financially? So I would think that Catholic schools eventually uh, uh, will be strong in promoting the Catholic ethos. If again, we can have a lot of lay workers, chaplains, uh, so-called chaplains, They're not chaplains, but uh, lay uh, workers uh, in the school, youth workers to help to energize and to uh, form young people. But of course, uh, recruiting these uh, workers, uh, these youth workers, we have to pay from own pocket. And this is where the Catholic community will have to support schools. Right. I think once we have that, uh, then the people will come to know uh, Jesus directly or indirectly. And I think this is where we can strengthen our Catholic values. Your Grace, we've been blessed to have priests who have served uh, the Archdiocese for many, many years. Mm -hmm. Many of them have celebrated their diamond jubilees, their uh, golden and silver jubilees. You mentioned earlier also that uh, you are looking into building a retirement home yeah. uh, for our aging priests. Can you give us a little bit more about the plans of this? We have started the first retirement home as a, can say, a pilot scheme because the present one at uh, uh, Upper Thompson uh, is a bit run down. Mm. So we feel that uh, uh, we should provide them with better facilities. And so we have the, bought a place at the, next to OLPS, uh, where it's called the East Bethany, uh, where we could house about uh, maybe 12 elderly priests. And we hope to provide uh, uh, staff there as well to look after their health and also to manage the place for them so that the elderly priests will have a dignified way of life um, and especially those who need some help, uh, they can uh, at least continue with their ministry in some ways. But those places are actually uh, meant more for uh, priests who are still mobile, are still, act, we can say, yeah, still able to uh, minister. Mm. So the, eventually, of course, uh, those priests who um, really need nursing care, full-time nursing care, then they will need to go to the nursing home. Uh, um, so we are starting with the East Bethany first, and uh, if the place is uh, what we call suitable and we find that the priests are happy, then pro probably if there are more elderly priests, I think there will be more in time to come because we are aging population. Mm -hmm. We might have to build other homes for priests. Right. So that's why it's called East. Uh, thinking perhaps we might have North, we might have South, we must right. have uh, West or whatever it is. Right. Yeah. Your Grace, you've always underscored the importance of communion and mission across the parishes, our organizations, and the movements in the church. Essentially to you, Share with us what you mean by communion in mission. Communion mission, uh, mission in communion, and this is the phrase that has been coined by Pope John Paul II. Um, our mission in the church is communion because we are all, the church is called to be a sacrament of love and unity in the world. And so the, the theological basis for this communion is Precisely the Holy Trinity, 
the Father and the Son and the Spirit in communion and uh, together they bring about uh, pour, or pouring their love into the world and so all of us we are therefore called to live this Trinitarian life of communion because again I say at the end of the day uh, what makes us happy is when there is love when there is unity irrespective of race language or religion so the task of the church is to promote unity within the church outside the church with other religions and the whole humanity and so the church is called to be a model and to be that sign so if that's the case then communion must begin with us so if we are not in communion how can we say that our mission is communion because people will laugh at us uh, to see us divided so that is the reason why uh, because the mission is communion we must be uh, in communion with respect to the mission and so this is where it's very important for us to align ourselves so uh, the diocese must be aligned with the universal church the parishes must be aligned with the archdiocese and then the organizations within the parish must be aligned with the parish vision and mission but all working towards the same goal in different ways in different areas but it's the same goal on at different levels and so this is where uh, it's important for us to as what Pope John Paul II tells us it's important to cultivate the spirituality of communion among ourselves so it's not just uh, mission and communion on the level of approaches on the level of projects uh, but it's also communion in terms of fellowship in terms of love Earlier we spoke, uh, Your Grace, about the number of Catholics who are actually active in church. How can we try and help the rest and motivate them so that the church in Singapore becomes revitalized, more energized, and then maybe truly be the missionary church that we should be? and that Jesus has called us to become? Presently, the, in most churches, uh, although we have only one third of our Catholics attending Sunday services, as you know that even with one third Catholics attending our services, our churches are packed. Right. Um, so if we want to have all Catholics attending services, we might have to build another 60 churches. <laughs> because already with one third attending our services, many parishes have six, seven, even eight masses, and every service is full. So, um, that is one aspect. The other aspect is um, with regards to those active in the communities. Presently, there are about, on average, between eight to, let's say, 12% active parishioners. So, in every parish, let's say, uh, 8,000 par uh, parishioners, we have about more or less 1,000 active in church. This is 10%. Um, and they are mostly in organizations. Um, strictly speaking, the organizations, in terms of membership, I think they are enough. Except for a few. Uh, we could have more categories, for example. But uh, generally, you can say most of organizations uh, have uh, sufficient numbers, of course they can have more. Even if we increase by five percent or twenty percent, you know, we still got eighty percent. Mm. They can't be doing everything in the church. So that is why the church, uh, you know, in life there is a certain optimum level. Uh, if you have three hundred members in the choir, surely half of them will resign because there is no personal contact. Right. Uh, when the when the membership gets too big, it becomes impersonal. When it becomes impersonal, people lift. Mm? Uh, that's why the I always feel that the method of the Legion of Mary is followed by many even secular organizations. In the Legion of Mary, the group cannot grow beyond ten to fifteen members. The moment it goes beyond fifteen, you break. That's called cell. You break the cell because the, after it becomes too big, it becomes an like organ. Uh, you need to have cells. So we break, and then the group will grow again. And when it grow, it breaks, and that is how we multiply. 
So I think in the church, I think there are not enough opportunities for service. We are asking people to come and serve, but it's the same in the serve organization. So they need to, again, this is where the new evangelization is important. New methods, new ways. They must, must also think of not just art intra. The church must also have organizations that are art extra, trying to serve the bigger community or reaching out to people beyond the parish or outside the outside the, the parish itself, their neighborhood, these are the activities they should, or even organize programs, because I think the more we can get the people to be involved in the church, and then the more we can build community. So presently, I think uh, there is only so much the, we can do within the church ground, because uh, organizations are so limited, everybody is looking for a space also. You cannot have so many organizations within one church, impossible. So we need an organization that are also reaching out. I think the church cannot be inward looking. The church exists for society, the church exists for the world. So they need to think of other ways where they can serve the bigger community. And that is the way we evangelize Christ. Right. Well, Grace, there's so much that the Archdiocese can look forward to mm. uh, in, in the vision that you have shared with us. Uh, I mean, your priests behind you, but with so much that's going on. How can Catholics come and, and support these programs? Uh, and what, what kind of contributions can, can the laity and the public, Catholic population make? Well, the, in different ways, according to their charisms, according to the resources, but I think, as I've said, uh, the first thing perhaps Catholics can do is to help me to spread the message to, mm. of the new evangelization. I'm sure three quarters of them do not even know what is the trust of the church and the trust of the universal church. So I think the first thing our Catholics can do is try to spread the urgency of the new evangelization, of the new evangelization renewal within the church, and spreading the good news beyond the church. That's the first thing. Then, secondly, I think the Catholics can do is to keep on encouraging each other uh, to deepen their spiritual life. I mean, those are the foundations. The rest comes later. Without this, we cannot talk about the rest. The foundation. We need to renew their faith. They need to go for retreats. They need to um, find ways and means uh, to, to renew their relationship with the Lord. After that, uh, then we can talk about the rest. Because for me, it's, uh, I don't believe in telling people, our Catholics, uh, to do things if they're not convinced. So, of course, at the end of the day, for all these programs to go on, we need money. There is no doubt. We need to build infrastructures. There is no doubt. But see, our Catholics are certainly not giving enough. To uh, although we are the biggest church in Singapore as a church, you know, our collection is the very insignificant, our Sunday collections. And so that's why the officers, I cannot um, fulfill, we cannot build up our officers because they are short of funds. Our organizations are short of funds. Our, they are short of places, buildings. So we need infrastructures. We need funds to pay for infrastructures, for operations. Uh, presently, all the officers, they are having only a skeleton staff. How do we reach out to the whole world? How do we help the whole church when the office uh, don't have the proper facilities and also the proper staff? So we need money for that. But that again, um, I don't want Catholics just to give for the sake of giving. They must know what they are doing. Because for those people, not all Catholics are, can be active in church because some of them have other responsibilities. Uh, Catholics also must not think that just because they're not active in church, huh, uh, they are maybe busy in their own profession as a doctor or lawyer or uh, those who are in the public service, they are also doing church work. 
anything that is done for the glory of God, for the service of God, that is also church work. You cannot distinguish between this is church work and that is not. Any work that is done for God is really godly work. Mm. It's a question of your motive. So there are some people who cannot be personally active in the church, but they are prayerful, they attend Mass regularly, they read up about their faith, they have a faith community to share their faith, but they cannot be serving in the church like others. So some of these people, uh, those who have funds, they can provide funds. But again, it's everybody must see that whatever we do, whether sharing of resources, whether giving out money, uh, they are meant for the mission of the church. And every Catholic uh, has a responsibility, uh, has an obligation uh, to help the mission of the church. So this is an obligation. You might not go out as a missionary, but if you have the funds and you have other responsibilities, then you should provide the funds accordingly. So give with a purpose. So I'm sure that if more Catholics are willing to give their time, their services, those who have no money can give time, can give resources. If we work together, we pull all this together, then of course we can build a church. Thank you, Your Grace. Okay, thank you.